Okay, uh, welcome to the Cassini Grand Finale Discoveries and Science Highlights one year later session. It's a union session and it will be recorded. <coughs> so smile into the camera. <laughs> Our next speaker is Michelle Darty, and she'll be talking about Saturn's magnetic field observations from Cass the Cassini Grand Finale. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you. I'm going to be talking to you today about the uh, implications of the uh, end of mission data for the uh, field of Saturn. But before I do that, let me just uh, take a step back and just remind ourselves what it is we knew before the end of mission data came through. And one of the complications was that um, the, um, all of the MAG data had a planetary period oscillation in it. Um, the entire magnetosphere was filled with this, affected all the fields and particles data sets. And this period of the PPOs changed with hemisphere and with season, clearly wasn't coming from the interior, but coming from the atmosphere instead. Um, and since the primary target of the end of mission was to try and determine any asymmetric component of the magnetic field, we needed to make sure that we understood this PPO period very well so we could actually tease out from the data what was coming from the interior. And so what we knew before the end of the mission was being able to resolve an internal planetary field up to degree three. There were some hints for some higher order moments of degree four and five. But as Linda mentioned, perhaps the biggest surprise was the fact that we were showing that the tilt between the dipole and the rotation axis was really very small. And this was a real surprise. Planetary dynamo theory suggests that you need there to be a tilt to generate the field. And so we were hoping the end of mission data set would help us understand better what was going on. So this shows you the trajectory of the spacecraft. This is a meridional view. Um, you can see the planet, you can see the rings marked off, and you can also see the field lines of Saturn. The trajectory of the spacecraft is clearly seen there. It's, um, I think it's the first trajectory of the grand finale orbits, but all the others were pretty similar. And the region marked in red is when the magnetometer instrument was in its highest measuring range, above 10,000 nanotesla. We were last in this range when we flew past the Earth in 1998, so we needed to really focus on being able to calibrate the instrument in this range during the end of mission data. What you will also see is the auroral field line current shown in green, and you'll see that in the northern hemisphere we expected to move quite quickly through that region. In the southern hemisphere we would skirt through it for quite a long period of time. You'll actually see that in the data set. Now, this auroral field aligned current region actually consists of three separate high latitude field, field aligned current systems. The first system is the quasi steady one that we always expect to see at planets that generate aurora, and the other two rotate with their respective hemispheres PPO period. And this gives rise to the PPO, PPO modulation that we see in the field data. And the complication is that these three systems are approximately co-located with each other, and that leads to the modulation of the field line currents that we see in the BFI component, the azimuthal component, which I'm going to show you shortly. So the data I'm going to show you, some of it was um, presented in the science paper that was published recently, and towards the end of the talk, I'm going to show you data that, um, from all of the orbits. But the science paper um, focused on nine of the first 10 orbits, what you can see there are the three components of the magnetic field. You've got the radial component on the left, the theta component or the north-south component in the middle, and the azimuthal component to the right. All three of those components are shown in the same way. We're plus or minus four hours around closest approach. And the dashed line shown in each of those plots shows you when we were in our highest measuring range, above 10,000 nanotesla. And you'll take two things from this plot very quickly. One of them is that the data was extremely repeatable. Those different colors show you the different revs, and they essentially lie on top of each other for each of the revs. The other thing that you'll see there is the azimuthal component is very much smaller. It's two orders of magnitude smaller than the radial and the theta components. And it's this azimuthal component that's going to give us any non-axis symmetry, so we really need to understand this component very well. The same plot, but marked in, are the high-latitude auroral field line currents that we expected to see. And you can see 
on the right-hand side of the plot, that's the southern hemisphere. You can see it was much more disturbed as we were skirting through and spending much more time in that auroral field line current region. And so seeing that signature in the data was not a surprise. What was a surprise was the peak around closest approach. So on all of these revs, you can see a peak in BFI around closest approach and sharp gradients on either side, which are, the, which are field aligned currents. And this highlights a new discovery that, that, that we made, hadn't been observed before, which was essentially low latitude field line currents confined within the inner edge of the D-ring. And so if we, if we add that to the schematic that we showed earlier, that green region there shows you this newly discovered low latitude field line current system. And we're spending a lot of time within the MAG team and the other fields and particles teams as well to try and best understand this data set. And in fact, some work that Greg Hunt is doing at the moment shows that the current densities are an order of magnitude lower for this low latitude field line current system than they are for the auroral current densities we see at higher, at, higher, at higher latitudes. And we think these differences are due to several factors. Firstly, the current sheet width is narrower for the auroral region and the field region and the area is smaller for the auroral region as well. And last but not least, the field tilt with respect to the ionosphere is greater in the equatorial current. And we think that's the reason why we're seeing these different current densities. So since it's the B5 signal that's going to give us any knowledge of non axisymmetry let's focus on that. And this um, figure here, this data here, is data from uh, nine of the first 10 orbits. We're looking at just under an hour on either side of closest approach. Different colors as usual show you the different revs. Um, we're in our highest measuring range here, so you can see digitization noise in the data. But also marked in this plot are where the different rings are, both in that bound and outbound, and also the synchronous point, both inbound and outbound. And what you'll see in these early orbits is that there is no evidence of strong field line currents on field lines connecting to the A, B, or C rings. All we can see is the clear strong field line cu current signatures which are connected to the inner edge of the D-ring. But you can also see that there's some variability in that B5 component around closest approach. But let's extend this data set now and take a look at what the B5 component looks like for all 22 of the grand finale orbits. And here you will see that there's in fact much stronger variability of B5 inside of the D-ring field line including a strong negative B5 component, particularly for Rev 292. In addition to that, you can see that there's an additional B5 peak over the B ring for one of the revs on the inbound and for many more of the revs on the outbound. And this, uh, this, uh, this additional B5 peak is close to the synchronous point. And so we're really trying to get our heads around what's going on in this data set so that we can actually model what we're seeing in the data. But we think it's linked to the fact, this is some work that Christian Karana did um, earlier on in the year, there's a velocity shear between the northern and the southern foot points of the magnetic field lines in the mid to low latitude region at Saturn. And this has been shown to actually be able to generate a peak in B5 inside of the D-ring. But some more recent work being done by Max Aguiwal at Imperial College. She's using generalized Ohm's law to actually evaluate the currents that are generated due to the shear and then, and then calculating the associated B5. What she's found is that if there's a factor three variability, either in the wind speeds or in the conductivities in the northern and the southern ionosphere, this can actually generate the reversal that we see in B5 for Rev 292. And there's a poster that Oleg Shabanitz will um, present later in the week, which actually talks in more detail about the conductivities in the ionosphere. And I think Hunter Waite is going to touch on this in his talk later on in this session. So let's now move on to the uh, radial and the uh, theta components of the field and see what that will tell us about the dynamo field or the internal planetary field model that will tell us what's going on in the interior. And so what the data set has allowed us to do is to directly measure the offset of the magnetic equator. And in the left-hand plot there, you can see that it's offset north by 0 0.0466 planetary radii. 
And so that plot on the left is actually plotted in a different way to what you've seen before. This is the cylindrical radial component of the field against height above the magnetic equator. And you can see it's a very consistent feature. There is some very small variation from orbit to orbit, and we're actually going to be using that small variation to see whether it will help us find any measure of non-axisymmetry. And so what, what is occurring is, is shown on the right. We've got this northward offset of the magnetic equator at Saturn. So let's then use this longitudinal variation of the magnetic equator to see if it can tell us a little bit about the non-axisymmetry. And so what we're seeing here is we're seeing the magnetic equator on the y-axis and the longitude of Saturn on the x-axis. If there was no tilt at all between the rotation and the dipole axis, you would expect the magnetic equator to look like that dashed line. So it would be the same for all of the longitudes around Saturn. If we had a one degree tilt, which is what we thought was occurring from the Pioneer and the Voyager era, you would expect the magnetic equator to vary with longitude as that blue line that is shown. And that gives a delta Z of 1900 kilometers over the different longitudes. If you had a 0.1 degree tilt, which is the red line, and that's what we thought we were seeing at the beginning of the Cassini era, the red line can be shown, and that gives you a delta Z of 190 kilometers across the different longitudes. But in fact, what we measured were those open green circles. That shows you the data. And that gives you a measured delta Z over all longitudes of less than 18 kilometers. If we convert that into a dipole tilt, that gives us a dipole tilt less than 0 0.0095 degrees. And so we thought, hey, maybe we shouldn't be using angles to describe the dipole tilt. Let's convert it into arc seconds. And so at Saturn, what we have shown with the Cassini grand finale data is the dipole tilt is less than 35 arc seconds. And you can see the list on the right there is actually showing you how our knowledge of the upper bound of the dipole tilt at Saturn has evolved as we've got closer and closer to the planet. And this value is a thousand times smaller than we've seen at both the Earth and at Jupiter. So to... Ooh, I see I'm getting close to the end. What is it that we've been able to do as resolving the higher order moments at Saturn? Well, before the Cassini grand finale, we will be able to measure the dipole, the quadrupole, and the octopole terms. Following the grand finale data, we've now been able to take um, the axisymmetric part up to degree 11. The dashed line that you can see there is the five sigma uncertainty. If we try to go to higher order moments, 12, 13, and 14, you can see they're not resolved, they're below the uncertainty levels. But if we are able to resolve them, when we look more closely at the data, they're likely to be an order of magnitude smaller than the higher order moments. And to end, I'd like to talk a little bit about what this new upper bound on the dipole tilt suggests as far as the internal structure at Saturn is concerned. The right-hand schematic is one that Linda showed earlier. This shows a meridional view of the MAG observations from the grand finale. Field lines are shown as solid lines, and overlaying on the spacecraft trajectory is the measured azimuthal component of the field that we, we measured during the first grand finale orbit. And you can clearly see the high latitude auroral field line currents and the low latitude interhemispherical field line current system. But underneath the surface, what we are finding is that there are consistent small scale axisymmetric internal magnetic field structures which are originating in the shallow interior, and they're shown in that right-hand schematic there um, as um, field lines inside the planet itself. Below that, there's a tentative deep stable layer, and below that further, there's a deeper dynamo layer, and this is all overlying a central core, and all of these regions are shown as the dashed semicircles, and also the A, B, and the C rings are labeled too. Now, some very recent work by Hao Chao, who uh, will describe this in more detail in his poster later in the week, uh, focuses on that left-hand plot that you can see, which shows the attenuation factor of the dipole tilt versus the stable layer thickness. And what his work is revealing is that the new upper bound we've derived for Saturn's dipole tilt suggests that the stable layer which overlies the, under, the deep dynamo is somewhere between 950 to 6,000 kilometers thick. And this range comes from considering the uncertainties of the deep flow speed and the electrical conductivity of metallic hydrogen. So I've got the red light flashing at me. 
just to point you to two posters, the poster that, uh, that Howe is going to present uh, on what the implications of the magnetic field are as far as the internal structure of Saturn is concerned, and Oleg's poster looking at the Saturn at the ionospheric conductivities based on the grand finale data. And since I'm way out of time, I'll just leave the summary slide up. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, we have time for one brief question. Luciano. So the, the, the uncertainty in the magnetic equator is not very different in the uncertainty of uh, the pole of rotation of Saturn. So those uh, 35 uh, or 36 R seconds uh, that you quoted uh, are referred to a given, uh, uh, a given pole, a given reference frame. Which mm -hmm. one? How? Can you answer that? Ah, so it's, uh, so it's maybe not uh, the right one because there was an offset and the discrepancy between the latest findings. Uh, and uh, so it's something interesting to check. Okay, thanks, Luciano. Okay, our next talk, once it gets up there. Okay, our next talk is given by Dick French, and it's entitled Radio Science Highlights of the Cassini Grand Finale Orbits. Radio Science instrument on Cassini is the four meter dish that you can see here at the top, which had three different wavelengths. So it was used not only for communication, but also for science observations. And it also had a different use in the grand finale orbits as the shield of Achilles protecting all of the sensitive instruments as we went ram direction through the ring plane. These Saturn system, of course, is uh, marvelously diverse. We didn't have the chance to observe every single one of these satellites over the course of the mission, but this picture is a nice uh, depiction of the targets of some of the radio science observations. We had a chance to look at the structure of the rings, the mass of the rings, the atmospheres of Saturn and Titan from radio occultations, measuring the gravitational fields of the icy satellites and of uh, Titan itself. And I'd like to highlight uh, today most of the observ some of the observations concentrating on the grand finale. But I thought it was important to acknowledge um, the passing of a giant in science and a member of the radio science team, uh, Bruno Bertotti, who was the brainchild behind one of the early experiments on the Cassini mission, which was when the sun was in between the Earth and the spacecraft, um, we had an opportunity to test uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity by looking for the deflection of the radio signal. That article, I believe, but I'd love to be challenged by other teams, I think is the most heavily cited article from the entire Cassini mission. As of last week, it was over a thousand citations. It also is one of the longest standing results, I think. It's a measurement from 2002, which even to this day is the best single measurement of the uh, theory of general relativity, measuring it to an accuracy of a part in 100,000. We hope that with the Gaia measurements of uh, stellar positions and with the Bepi Colombo mission, which has been launched, uh, we'll be moving to a new level of accuracy in general relativity but I think all of us can feel some pride in the fact that Cassini 
has a record that's 16 years in standing of one of the most fundamental principles of physics. Over the course of the Cassini orbital tour, there were multiple opportunities for uh, atmospheric occultations, ring occultations, gravity measurements of satellites, and the also by static observations off of the surface of Titan, all using 13 watts of radio power. But of course, the grand finale was the greatest opportunity for us to measure the gravitational field of Saturn. By getting up close, you have a chance to recognize the difference between its gravitational field and that of a sphere. Its non-spherical contributions to the gravitational field are most easily measured when you're close. And also, when you're in between the planet and the rings, you have a chance to extract from that gravitational Doppler signature the mass of the rings themselves. So the, just to give you a, a polar sense of how close you really are during those 22 grand finale orbits, which gave us a chance to explore the depths of the wind, the differential rotation within Saturn, Saturn's mass, and uniquely uh, and importantly, the opportunity to compare with Jupiter. And in the session following this one in this room, there will be results from Juno showing, uh, providing, and this afternoon too, opportunities to compare these two giants of our solar system and their internal structure, magnetic fields, and winds. So six of the grand finale orbits were dedicated to radio science. Um, if you remember the first picture, you saw that the antenna pointed in one direction, and all of the remote sensing instruments are strapped on the side of the spacecraft pointing in other directions. Not everybody gets to look at what they want to in any given orbit, and I think it's a testament to the importance that all scientists placed on getting good gravity measurements for Saturn and the rings that allowed us to have the coverage we needed in order to be able to get accurate results. So the geometry of these is quite complex. The uh, spacecraft in the left image is shown flying between the rings uh, and Saturn. Those Blue tick marks show 10 minute intervals during the radio occultation during that part of the orbit. And then later on in the figure at the right, the blue shows the spacecraft from an Earth view receding underneath and behind the rings. This is one of the most complex parts of a radio science observation. And I want to acknowledge that the instrument was not only on the spacecraft, but also on the ground at space complexes around the world. And importantly, highlighted here in blue, is the first mission where we had an opportunity to use the European Space Agency ground stations as well as the three NASA ground stations. And you can see in the bottom figure, it shows the elevation of Cassini above the horizon. High elevation is good. Low elevation, you're in the soup. And you can see that without the two ESA stations, especially in that middle figure that we would have been, uh, that Cassini with its southern declination would have been at the right low on the horizon from Spain and Goldstone, but high in the sky from the Malargue station, helping us to get the signal to noise that we needed. The radio science operations team on Earth spent seven 36-hour shifts. They don't look as sleepy here as at the beginning of that series of uh, six orbits, but they deserve a big hand as well for flawlessly carrying out these observations. The measurements are made by sending a radio signal from the Earth uh, with a very stable frequency up to the spacecraft. The measurement is one of a Doppler shift, so you need a very high frequency, stable frequency standard supplied by measures on the Earth. Transponder on the Earth acts like a mirror and reflects that radio signal back to the Earth at two different wavelengths, from which you can measure the Doppler shift, but as you know, the Doppler shift is only the radial component of the velocity, not the transverse component. So you need to do modeling as well to make sure that the observations are consistent with the data. Uh, and just uh, here's an indication, uh, sort of a, a shout out for Paolo Rochopa's talk uh, later this afternoon, which goes into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, the upper plots show the uh, scatter in the residual Doppler shift, which is at the level of fractions of a millimeter a second, roughly the speed of uh, Washington traffic this morning. Um, <laughs> and 
the bottom signatures show the sensitivity of the gravity measurement to an odd harmonic of Saturn's gravity field, J3, an even harmonic, J10, and the mass of the B-ring. And the importance here is that each of these is a unique signature. So even though individually they contribute a very small part to the gravitational signature, they're identifiable because they have a unique Doppler signature. And from this, we've been able to extract uh, remarkable results. The curve at the left compares the gravitational harmonics uh, up to degree 10 from Jupiter in blue and Saturn in red. And what you can see is that the uh, Jupiter results show two curves that are almost on top of each other, one for uniform rotation and one for differential rotation. You apply that same kind of model for Saturn and you see a very large difference between the differential rotation and the solid body rotation. Clear evidence for a very deep differential rotation, probably on cylinders deep within Saturn itself. And this will be highlighted in a talk this afternoon by Militzer. Similarly, it's possible to determine characteristics of Saturn's cloud level winds from the gravitational harmonics. As you go up in gravitational harmonic, you're more sensitive to what's happening near the surface of the planet. And at the left, you can see the latitude on Saturn and that those varying curves are the strength of the east-west winds. Uh, you can see the sim level of symmetry between the north and southern hemisphere. And the comparison between the black and the red shows the success of the models uh, of the interior shown on the right as this uh, deep into the interior on cylindrical rotation, ending 9,000 kilometers below the surface, just at about the level where ohmic dissipation is expected. So it's really a, a terrific result uh, that you should uh, visit this afternoon's talk to hear more about. One of the key objectives of the gravity measurements was to infer the mass of Saturn's rings, which is determined as part of the overall solution for the gravity field. Uh, it's a bit less than uh, half a Mimas mass. The article by Luciano Yes has just been accepted uh, in science, which includes the numerical details. This estimate is comparable to recent inferences from Cassini data of from uh, density waves in Saturn's B-ring by uh, Matt Hedman and Phil Nicholson a couple of years ago, uh, but it, it uh, implies an important constraint on the rings that we'll be hearing about shortly in this session. There are several arguments for how the mass of the rings affects the age of the rings. Uh, one of them has to do with the recession of small satellites from the edges of the rings due to gravitational torque. Another is related to the sharpness of the inner edges of the A and B rings, the so-called ballistic transport age. Another that I know Jeff will be highlighting is the sort of ring pollution time scale. The idea that the rings look very bright, but they're constantly being contaminated by interplanetary dust, and that sets a clock on the age of the rings. And uh, collectively, the low mass indicates a low mass for the rings. We also had an opportunity during the mission to observe uh, radio occultations, and this is a one-dimensional scan of the optical depth of the rings compared here to a two-dimensional image from uh, the imaging instrument, but the advantage of the radio science observations and other occultations is that we get very high radial um, resolution, sometimes uh, approaching 100 meters. We also had a chance to observe the rings at a variety of opening angles over the course of the mission. Here you can see the ring opening angle is seen from the Earth where we receive the radio signal modulated over the course of Saturn season by the ripples of the Earth's annual journey around the Sun. And circled at the upper right you can see that we're looking at the rings at the widest open angle of the entire mission, meaning that we can probe most deeply into the high optical depth regions of the rings. Here illustrated with a radial scan showing the C ring at the left, the high optical depth B rings in the middle, and the Cassini division at the right. Linda Spilker showed this image earlier 
uh, indicating what we actually can see during a radio occultation. The upper plot to recapitulate is the optical depth profile of the rings from the inner part C ring to the A ring in the outer edge. And what's uh, terrific about these observations is we get not only the optical depth of the ring, but the scattered signal from the adjacent particles of the rings, which enable us to think of the rings as a giant diffraction screen and to sample sub uh, structure of the rings at the scale of 50 to 100 meters. So these are essentially uh, reconstructions from the Doppler shift of the received signal that those strips are telling us that we have constructive uh, diffractive interference with regularly spaced structure at the scale of 50 to 100 uh, meters. So I'll leave this summary side here just to say this is one of the best opportunities for observing the rings over the entire mission. Uh, we, had, we saw a microstructure that varied in time. And in my final slide, I'd like to highlight the fact that the, not only did we have an early observation of general relativity early in the mission, but we had a chance to do Cassini's final radio experiment as we watched the flickering signal disappear as finally the spacecraft at two different wavelengths we could see the signal flicker and disappear um, as the tumbling finally overtook the spacecraft. Uh, I think we'll be able to extract the, something interesting about Saturn's atmosphere. So from beginning to end, this has been a, a spectacular mission for radio science, and it's been an honor to represent the results of the entire team. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more one question. Please use the mic. And I see uh, we have a question. Good morning. Good morning. Let's see. Yeah. Good morning, Dick Paul Steffes from Georgia Tech. Uh, you showed some very nice work on the optical depth of the rings. I'm wondering, 14 years later, do we have any insight into the optical depth of the atmosphere and the accompanying high vertical resolution profiles of ammonia and phosphine that can be retrieved? I wish I could say that that work had been written, but uh, the data are in the public domain and we have team members working on it too. So I'd be happy to talk with you about getting access to the observations. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Hunter Wade, and he'll be talking about the coupling of Saturn's atmosphere and ionosphere to the rings. Thank you, Thank you Scott. All right, um, I would like to talk a little bit about the uh, measurements that uh, INMS and RPWS, and it also applies to some of the MIMI observations during the last uh, part of the mission. This is, uh, we will be looking mainly at the uh, ion neutral mass spectrometer data. Note that there are two ways for gas to get into this instrument, a closed source that measures the non-reactive gases, um, the neutrals, and in the open source, we can ma make ion measurements. You notice that the ion measurements have to be electrostatically turned into the analyzer, and that, um, was designed for flybys of Titan at seven kilometers per second and not 31 kilometers per second. So we're limited to just measuring light ions during the proximal phases of the mission, but we can put that together with the RPWS data to make some nice infer inferences. This is a figure that shows model profiles of H2, uh, HE, and CH4. You can see that the H2, uh, well, and you also see the altitude bands during the proximal orbit phase of the mission. So the lo lowest band is the one 
I'm going to concentrate on. That's yellow, but I'll show data from both the high and the middle range as well. Uh, note that the HE and H2 data fit fairly well with the uh, models that had evolved before, uh, during, before uh, the proximal phase. However, note that there's a very large discrepancy in what we would expect for CH4, where we saw considerable CH4 and would have expected to see none during that particular phase of the mission. Most of it would be confined to the lower atmosphere, as you can see from the blue line. All right, to give you an idea, this is a figure that shows um, a tip, typical flyby. I think this is 288, yes, it's 288. And you can see the black line indicates the altitude, and along the bottom axis is the latitude. Uh, I put this up to clearly, this is H2, I put this up to clearly indicate that there's this correlation between altitude and latitude that's persistent throughout the proximal data set. So it uh, makes it hard to draw some inferences as to whether variations have to do with just latitude or with altitude. And that is in particularly true of this particular figure where I'm showing um, temperatures that we've derived and in the center, which are at the lowest altitudes, the temperatures are fairly consistent with what was determined by UVS earlier uh, around 340 degrees Kelvin, but at the at both, both edges at higher latitudes, but also at higher altitudes, you can see the temperatures rise up. And this is the first indication from us of, uh, well, these are things that affect the temperature, could, could be the um, field of line currents that Michelle was talking about, or they could actually be material that's in falling from the rings and in, in, since they're at different high, uh, higher velocities due to their Keplerian rotation velocity, they can cause heating in the upper atmosphere as well. The altitude at which this departure occurs is about 2,000 kilometers, above 2,000 kilometers, which is in the exabase. Okay, and this is a figure that Linda showed earlier. It shows three of the lowest altitude proximal orbits with a very complex spectrum, as was mentioned. So the H2 and HG were expected, but this CH4 and the CO2, the CO and N2, H2O, um, ammonia and the organics were not anticipated. Uh, there's a lot of ring material falling in. It does vary, uh, as does the composition of this infalling material, a little bit depending on which um, which proximal orbit we were looking at, which are slightly different Saturn longitudes, but the order of magnitude of the material is about 10,000 kilograms of material per second. Quite a bit of large amount of material that's then falling into the atmosphere. This can have clearly pronounced effects, and I'll talk a little bit about some of those. <coughs> to try to establish a little bit more about the form of the material that came in, we know that the organics correspond uh, quite likely to the nanograin particles that Mimi, uh, that Don Mitchell's gonna talk about a little bit later, but this figure tries to uh, look at a, a, a tries to look at the uh, two different masses that we measured with high signal to noise at the highest altitudes and show that um, in the yellow, which is um, mass 28, we see kind of two, uh, a kind of broad distribution as well as a very peak distribution that's right at the ring plane. And we uh, think of the broader distribution as being due to CO and N2 and the central peak distribution being due to C2H4 fragments that came from breakoff of these or organic nanograins. Correspond and the, and similarly, uh, the blue indicates the uh, CH4 that we measured, and it's a broader distribution as well. So the inference here that we make is that there are components of um, both vapor and grains that are in falling material, and we're we have been trying to separate this in some new data that we have analyzed in this next figure uh, from the final proximal orbit, which if you want to find out more details, you should go to Kelly Miller's talk that's indicated here. But you can see, I think I can hit it. There it is. There's the final plunge. 
and these are the rest of the proximal orbits. So we're trying to take differences of those for the various types of compounds and look if, if they're fundamentally different or the same. So the CH4 shows to be similar. The H2O shows to be quite different between the two. NH3, CO, N2, and CO2 all seem to be similar, but the organics are also quite different. And so this is a further reinforcement to us that the, the things that look similar are, in falling, are, are actually vapor in the ring plane that falls into the atmosphere and the things that look different, which are the water and the organics, are tied up in grains that are very confined in latitude to the central region. And this is one of the things that uh, Michelle was alluding to with regard to changes in conductivity that we might, uh, might suggest from this uh, in falling material is going to modify the ionospheric conductivity, both in grain and vapor form, but the um, differences in conductivity will be different for the region in the central core of that infalling material where you have nanograins and water present as opposed to the outer edges of that region where you have CH4 as the primary um, reactant with the H3 plus that's in the atmosphere. And so that would lead to differences in conductivity. Um, and it also kind of, uh, that region correlates, that central region correlates with negative ion formation that the RPWS people have talked about, which also modifies the conductivity. So there is some reason to think that there are conductivity changes as a function of latitude with the central band having a higher conductivity right near the equator. Okay, and to go on, and say a little bit more about the ionosphere. Uh, since we have to point directly <coughs> into the RAM direction to be able to measure the ionosphere, we were only able to get uh, four passes that had that orientation. Two of them in the two uh, upper panel show the correspondence between our light ions in black and the RPWS derived electron densities and they correspond quite well at the higher altitudes in the atmosphere. But in the lower altitudes, you note that the, there's a discrepancy between the black line and the red and, and blue lines that are the electron density. This discrepancy is due to the reaction with this infalling material that creates molecular ions and potentially negative ions in this central core region. So that is a further indication of the types of changes that we are expecting in the ionospheric chemistry due to this infalling material and, part, and an important part of the coupling process. This is another way of looking at that same data just so that you can get a little bit better latitudinal and altitude understanding of what, what we're seeing. Um, these lines, the broader lines indicate the light ion densities color-coded in spectrogram form. Um, for the four orbits that we've looked at, 288, um, 292, 283, and 287. And the smaller thin lines that are also color-coded are the electron densities. And you can once again see that the central core region near the ring plane is where the infalling material is affecting the ionospheric, uh, the light ions of the ionosphere and creating uh, larger uh, molecular ions as a result of those interactions. This is a model that Luke Moore put together to try to, again, uh, verify that, that kind of uh, phenomena. Uh, we see that he's able to model the H plus and HE plus that uh, INMS measured uh, fairly reasonably and, and with the incoming material that CH4 and water. In the lower panel, you can see that he creates uh, a lot of different molecular ions that can be seen in this region as well. So um, uh, in summary, um, we've identified complex chemical interactions between the Saturn atmosphere and the ring, well, the Saturn ionosphere and atmosphere and the ring atmosphere. Uh, we have inferred that methane, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ammonia, and molecular nitrogen are flowing into the atmosphere as gaseous material from the rings. So they're in the rings as gaseous material and, and, in, and fall into the atmosphere. 
and that water, <coughs> excuse me, water and organic nanograins are actually come into the atmosphere uh, very close to the ring plane and are confined to the equator. Uh, the rate of the infall of material, um, I think maybe Jeff Cuzzy is going to say some more about this later on when he talks about the rings, but the D-ring would not last very long at this rate of inflow, a few thousands of years, so there's some suggestions here that there has to be ways to transfer perhaps C-ring material or other ring material into the D-ring or, it or it's a kind of a very short-lived feature in, in itself. And I'll stop there and I'll answer any questions. Okay, uh, we have time for a couple of questions. The observations of uh, water in a certain stratosphere over the whole disk uh, with the Infrared Space Observatory and the Herschel Space Observatory uh, suggest that the influx uh, is something about 10 to 20 kilograms per second. So your measurements are orders of magnitude uh, higher. Uh, do you have any explanation to that? Because if we would have uh, such high rates over long periods, hundreds to thousands of years. That would have been observed with ISO and Herschel. Yes, yeah, so uh, you're talking about higher latitudes in particular, right? Discoveraged. Excuse me? Discoveraged? Discoveraged observations. Okay. Well, uh, these are tightly confined to the equatorial region, and uh, that's what we infer from the present time. We've done it. Uh, there's been three separate calculations that verify equivalent, basically the same number. So we've carefully done that. I, I don't know what the discrepancy is really about. Maybe it has to do with the seeing some of the infalling material, 33% of this at least, as uh, organic nanograins, perhaps as much as 50%. So that might be hard to see in your observations. I'm not, I'm not certain. But we should talk afterwards. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you. And uh, it's better to come up on the, uh, I guess it would be your left side of the stage. Our next talk is given by Don Mitchell, and he'll be talking about new science results from the Cassini Grand Finale mission phase based on measurements by the magnetosphere, ma Magnetospheric Imaging Instrument, Mimi. Thank you. Uh, so this is an image of the spacecraft as it's going down into the atmosphere. The Mimi instrument is uh, in a couple of places on the spacecraft because we have, we have three different sensors and so we, uh, we have several science re results from this period that are uh, basically unrelated to each other partly because of the three different sensors do different things but we'll get into that. Also I wanted to plug this science symposium one more time. Uh, Linda talked about this. This is going to be at APL uh, May 20th to 24th this uh, next year, and uh, so save the date if you are interested in the last, hopefully, I mean, we, this is the second last one. So uh, uh, my outline for this talk, in case I don't make it through everything in great detail, is also the results. So one of the things that we uh, observed were, were modulation of the uh, energetic electrons in the magnetosphere right up to the end of the mission at the rotation period of the, of the uh, SKR and PPO uh, phenomenology. Uh, 
the, we, we measured an inner radiation belt, uh, which had been hypothesized but not measured before, and we verified its existence and its origins. Uh, we saw this low altitude emission from the disk uh, during the uh, Saturn orbit injection, and so we re-measured this and found the variability in it during the uh, proximal orbits. That's energetic neutral atom emission, uh, re-emitted particles that came in as neutrals from the ring current, were temporarily trapped in the low uh, altitudes, and then came back out as neutrals and allowed us to image them with our neutral imager. And uh, also, uh, we, we had the opportunity to go through the ring current multiple times in the tail and s uh, measure its variability uh, with many returns to the same region. And, uh, and then we also uh, measured the dust uh, infall that, that uh, uh, Hunter Waite was talking about in the previous talk, and I'll, I'll touch on that as well. So this is a sequence that shows the flyby of, of, of the orbiter on one of the uh, orbits. Uh, this is 288, I think. I can't remember, 286. And uh, Inca is right in here. It's the spacecraft's rotating as we come through. The ram direction is, is coming up from below. And as we enter this region near the ring plane crossing, you'll see the uh, one of our actually housekeeping parameters come up. This was this the science that we did on the dust was done completely with housekeeping data. It didn't, wasn't our science data at all. And what we saw was that the singles rates on our starts in the in in the Inca sensor, which I won't explain, but basically went up to a very high level, the highest levels that we saw during the mission and then came back down, a very smooth curve, very little noise. It went up to about 300,000 counts per second uh, at the ring plane crossing and then dropped off very symmetrically as we left the, 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 as we crossed through the ring plane. There was one little hitch in it right there in the curve that's still very well um, characterized, still a lot of counts there. And, uh, and that was at a point where the atmospheric or the ionospheric densities got high enough to short out our, our high voltage plates that were turned on during this crossing and allow in the charged component of what turned out to be dust. So we were measuring dust all the way through here and as Hunter pointed out, concentrated right at the equator uh, very strongly. Uh, it, it sort of forms a, a Gaussian distribution about the equator and, and latitude. And, uh, and then uh, the ver there was uh, both neutral and charged components to that dust. This is a, a, a figure that shows details of that, and I'm not going to go through the whole figure, but uh, only to say that, that we had three different crossings for which we got these dust measurements. If you, these are the three different crossings at slightly different altitudes, but got about the same result. And we got uh, about a tenth of a, of a particle per cc uh, during that crossing in the size range of around one to two uh, nanometer particles, if you assume ice densities. Uh, the, the, because we had our high voltage plates on for one crossing and not for the other two, we were able to difference those, those and that's this purple curve. And you can see that uh, right at the, at the ring plane crossing at the center here, it was about 20% about uh, charged. If we get out to the wings of this distribution, which are, this is a log plot, so they're down a couple orders of magnitude here, but there's this extended population that goes much higher in latitude and that's 100% charged. So these are, are dust particles that are traveling along the field lines to get to the atmosphere, whereas those in the center are falling directly in uh, as mostly neutrals. Uh, these are the trajectories that those particles take in three different frames. If you go into the Keplerian frame of the D-ring, they just fall straight down, and they're, they're falling because of atmospheric drag uh, from high from the exospheric hydrogen, uh, the, if if you look in in the uh, um, 
which I can't even read from here. Sun fixed frame. Uh, the green. It's a green trajectory. If you if you go into a uh, into a frame rotating with Saturn, I think I have that backwards actually. The the, the blue frame is the sun fix sun fix fr frame, and the uh, green one is is the uh, rotating one. But anyway, uh, we were able to trace those trajectories through a model. Uh, moving on to the radiation belts, we went. Through Going through this same region, we measured directly very high energy particles in this region. Uh, these are particles caused by the CRAN process, cosmic ray albedo neutron decay, where you get a cosmic ray hit in the rings, creating a, a fast neutron that then decays into a proton and an electron and gets trapped uh, in the region here where uh, it can remain durably trapped for a long time. And this is uh, this has, produces both, uh, as I say, uh, protons and electrons, but it, we primarily measured the proton population up to uh, very high energies of uh, hundreds of uh, MeV. And this is the, the angular distribution we got and the, and the, L, the, the distribution in, in L value. Uh, of the details of this are in the science. Uh, paper by Russos and Coleman et al. Uh, also uh, measured were these, were these temporary uh, and spatially uh, isolated pieces of, of radiation belt in electrons. And these are, uh, these are kind of ephemeral features that show up at particular longitudes and uh, are Produced by the same CRAN process, but they they don't last. They don't uh, they don't spread out around the planet. They they just stay uh, in in one location, mostly on the sunward side, on on either side of the uh, of of noon. And we measured these things repeatedly during these uh, during those last orbits. The uh, the ring current uh, out in the night side. Uh, we had multiple passes through it during these uh, proximal and uh, F ring orbits uh, out at about 20 uh, Saturn radii, but all, all in, inbound and outbound at, at fairly high latitudes. Uh, although the, the, those were high latitudes, we were able to use uh, a magnetic field model to map those results to the equatorial region, so this gives you kind of equatorial uh, Variation in the in, in the uh, pressure in, in the fluxes and pressures of of the uh, energetic particles in the ring current, and it shows this big enhancement out uh, beyond 15 Saturn radii, where the beta of the plasma from the energetic particles goes up uh, well above one. And this was published by uh, Nick Sergis in GRL. Um, let's see. This, uh, one of the things that we saw earlier in the mission, but were able to see much closer up because of these orbit, orbital geometries that we got during the proximal orbits in the grand finale, uh, is emission of energetic neutral atoms above the auroral region, where you're getting the generation of ion conics. And uh, this was a, a, a paste up of some emission that we saw early earlier in the mission. Uh, let's see. Oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. This is a movie of, of, uh, from earlier in the mission where you can see this emission coming from the south polar region in energetic neutral atoms, uh, which we at the time surmised were, were uh, from these ion conics. And the ring current itself is, is this feature that was further out here. This is the movies that we got during the proximal orbits, and now we had much better spatial resolution on this feature. As we crossed through the equator during this particular orbit, we did not see that low altitude emission. There was just basically background noise as we crossed through the equator. And we come back to the southern uh, hemisphere and see again the polar emission from the energetic neutral atoms generated uh, during in this ion conic generation region, which is a rural process. And those, uh, those ion conics generated down here at low altitudes, when you look at them at high altitudes, 
up here as energetic ion beams that are field aligned and you get this uh, you get a characteristic spectrum with a big hump in it this stuff this is the most intense energetic ions that you see in the outer magnetosphere if you take the spectrum that we get from the ion from the energetic neutral atoms which is the blue spectrum here and divide it by the charge exchange cross section which creates the neutrals you get the uh, or rather you divide the ion observations by that cross section you get the red thing which matches the uh, the uh, ENA measured spectrum showing that the source is that then we also had the imaging looked for the imaging of this reflected emission down low and that was seen as we went through this is the one I just showed you which shows no emission at the equator the one on the left is a is a different rev and you can see that there was in fact emission as we cross the equator nothing here and and sensible admission at this point so we found that this was related to the intensity of the ring current on those particular revs those that had higher ring current activity had the uh, the low altitude emission and those that had the low activity did not uh, this is just the what I showed you early in the in my talk where we saw this very well uh, defined rotational modulation of the energetic electrons which we've seen through the whole mission and, and it happened all the way to the end and so that concludes my talk thank you <laughs> Questions for Don? Uh, Jeff, please use the mic. Uh, Don, uh, my understanding of these nano grains is they're so small they don't get charged very easily, but you were seeing charged grains at right. somewhat higher latitude. You want to say more about? Yeah, as I pointed out, but I was going by it pretty quickly, the, the, those were down about two orders of magnitude in density from the ones that we saw uh, right at the equator. So it's a very small fraction of the total population that is both small enough and charged uh, to be seen out on those wings. Those are the ones that are, that are, are dominated by electromagnetic forces and going along the magnetic field, whereas the main population was just dropping straight in as neutrals. There, there was a charge fraction amongst that, that group, but they may be getting charged on their way down. I don't Do you know. have an idea of the time scale it takes those particles to, to get that charge and get that high? Yeah, it's a strong function of the, of the, of the size of the particle, right. but at these sizes, the, the charging either from sunlight or from the local plasma electrons either going positive or negative is on the order of hours to days depending upon just where you are in that size distribution. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So, yeah, good morning. Um, I'm supposed to announce it. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, so our next speaker is Frank Postberg. Title of his talk is Enceladus Complex Organics, Saturn's Main Ring Composition and Oort Cloud Dust, the latest and best from Cassini CDA. Frank. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the end phase of Cassini mission and the last year have been really busy for the CDA team. Um, and here I'm going to summarize the, some highlights, some science highlights 
we are worked on recently and still working on. So the first topic uh, is not directly bound to the grand finale, but the data analysis took part during that phase, and it's about the complex organics we find in uh, about a few percent of the ice grains emitted by Enceladus. And you see here the mass spectrum, uh, and some, this is our poster child example where we see very strong peaks, over 1,000 AMU, so we have macromolecules here. And in this low mass range, we have a better spectral resolution, and these we interpret as fragments that are created upon impact of the particles. And we use these fragments uh, with a higher resolution to characterize these organic macromolecules. And here you see the mass line statistics of 84 events. Um, and I don't have time here to go into detail of the, of the analysis, but I summarized our um, most plausible interpretation here on the right. So we think we see a cross-linked macromolecular or polymeric material with oxygen and nitrogen bearing functional groups. where mostly isolated aromatic rings are connected by short aliphatic chains. So to visualize this, I looked for a few examples. And this is the first one from uh, insoluble organic matter from a Murchison meteorite. And you see that here we have these aromatic units um, connected by short aliphatic chains and these uh, oxygen-bearing and nitrogen-bearing functional groups. Uh, we have an, at least as good a match with some um, biogenic material, humic acid, and forming a, um, a macromolecule called, known as humic substance. And also there, all the characterizations match really well. So although our results are inconclusive if, if the stuff is of biogenic or from an abiotic process, it shows that Enceladus has a really complex organic chemistry going on and that we can actually sample and we can analyze this rich organic chemistry just by flying through the plume and a follow-up mission with a dedicated payload with better analytical tools will have the chance to, to characterize if it's really prebiotic chemistry or, or not. And this is even more, it becomes more important after the discovery that probably the entire hydrotherm, uh, entire core of Enceladus rocky core is hydrothermally active. So this porous core is water filled where ocean water enters at low latitudes and is heated up in the rocky core by tidally induced friction and the hydrothermal fluids go to the north and south and enter the ocean at the south and the north pole. So we probably probe the organic chemistry here of the Enceladian core that is created there at the hydrothermal conditions and then um, it can cross the ocean either by a thermal plume or, or probably both or by uh, the help of ascending gas bubbles. We have 3% of volatile gas in the plume so they can carry and harvest the organic chemistry bringing them up into the icy vents and then they are released by bursting gas bubbles and incorporated into ice grains. And if you want to hear more about Enceladus organics, then you can uh, attend my talk tomorrow in the Enceladus session. So now for the actual grand finale orbits um, of CDA, the main objective was to measure ejecta uh, thrown up from the main rings by uh, micrometeoroid bombardment. And these Debris of the main rings can either reach the gap between the ring and Saturn by on ballistic trajectories, or if they acquire sufficient charge, then they will couple to the magnetic field lines and travel along these and across the flight path of Cassini there. So um, we, and this will create two, dis, two very distinct um, peaks in the, in this, in the um, count rates. So for the Kepler grains, that we expect them to concentrate near the closest approach, whereas the ones that follow magnetic field lines can have significant delay before or after. By the way, the size range or size limit, detection limit at this speed is about 10 nanometer, and most of the stuff we see is between 10 and 50 nanometers. So we observe larger grains than were described by Mimi and IMS in the previous talks. And indeed, uh, depending on the pointing, we can observe and find these two distinct populations. If we point to the Kepler RAM, we see the, the, the grains nicely accumulated around the ring plane. And if we point to the plasma RAM, we are sensitive to the charged grains. We have a significant offset of the grains. In this case, to the south, uh, it's much more pronounced than in the north. That is probably due 
to the uh, offset to the another, no, offset of the of the magnetic dipole as described by Michel. But that means that here we probe actually deep down into the ring. So these these, these particles come from far away. They we are probing different regions here. So here we see the C ring, and in the equator we probably see more the composition of the D ring. Which brings us to the composition here. Uh, Linda already said we have two very distinct compositional types, silicate and water ice. And this is no surprise because these were, were known as the main constituents of the, of the ring before. So typically you expect a few percent of silicate at most, but we saw um, much more concentrations and by the way, um, we, although we find a few organics sometimes in the ice grains and some iron here in the silicates, we de don't find any indication for particularly enhanced concentrations of organics or iron that were suspected to be the darkening agent in the, in the main rings. But we see lots of silicates, much more than, than you would expect from remote sensing. 34% um, in number and 22% plus minus 10 in mass. And as you see here, this is the compositional profile of all uh, flybys combined. This is the abundance of water ice. It peaks here at the closest approach. There we come close to what can be reconciled with the re remote sensing results. But here at higher latitudes, we are observe at least 50% of silicates, which is uh, far more than expected. And yes, I think we also observe the ring rain here in these somewhat larger grains. You compare the rate profile, the total rate here in blue, with the profile known from the uh, ionospheric infrared emission attributed to the ring rain. This matches pretty well. And the fluxes we measure around 1,000 kilograms per second actually are sufficient to create this phenomenon. So what about the um, high silicate ratio we find? Um, so the high silicate ratio, particularly at this high latitude, probably reflects the much higher silicate abundance in the C ring compared with other parts of the ring. But still, this, is, this effect seems to be magnified, so we have not a good idea now what this is. Our speculation goes into somewhat a differential erosion that uh, depletes the, the, the water ice either directly when they're created from a micrometeoroid impact or on the way to the point where we detect them in the gap. And um, the ring darkening agent, well, we have no indication for abundance of overabundant organic material or iron, iron oxide. But as we heard before, in the very small grains which are invisible to us, the INMS sees abundant organics there. And Sean has a talk about all this tomorrow morning um, in, the, in, in the room 27, 207A. So finally, I want to focus on something which is which we are currently focusing on and probably will keep us busy for the, for the next one or two years, and that is dust entering the inner Saturnian system from outside Titan. And this exogenous dust traditionally we observe with the entrance grid system of the CDA here, two parallel uh, grid systems which can characterize the trajectory of the incoming dust grain and we can reconstruct the orbital elements really well and um, but this subsystem is only sensitive to fairly large grains, so it needs a grain with a radius above a micrometer. This is large for us, and we don't get any compositional information, but we have the best possible trajectory information. And since the, um, the, the most of the mass of the exogenous dust lies in these large grains, this sensor isn't enough to characterize the uh, contamination of the main rings to constrain the age of the main rings. But we recently used our spectrometer detector uh, uh, to do a similar measurements. There, we uh, don't have very good trajectory information. It's very limited. But we have compositional information with the spectra. And uh, this highest range we observe here is much smaller than with that. So we can only see grains smaller than half a micron in radius. So these two populations don't overlap at all. We should observe two very distinct, different size ranges here. So first I summarize the results from the entrance grid, the large grains larger than a micron. Um, this is now, every dot here is a detection of the grid system, of the which grains we attribute with confidence to exogenous origin. And you see that um, it's most densely populated here along this. This is now the uh, heliocentric distance here in astronomical units versus the eccentricity 
And uh, most of our detections are in agreement with Jupiter belt, uh, with Kuiper belt here in the top model in, on the background. And here's the model of the Jupiter family comets also here. You expect these populations. But there are other points here which are not in agreement with these families and we need different um, sources. So these, these guys here with large semi-major axis maxes are best matched by centaur type comets and the guys here with the super high eccentricities actually require halotype or odd cloud comets. And now we want to find these different populations with our spectrometer system to constrain the, the composition of these grains. So first, um, we have a to take into account an observational bias here. So we select with, um, with this subsystem, we select exclusively grains with non-icy origin, just to exclude the overwhelming abundant E-ring ice grains. We only take non-icy non spectra into account here. And with the, due to the poor resolution in space and velocity, naturally what we assign as an exogenous origin can are the most extreme cases. There we can say with the bigger, greatest confidence that they are of exogenous origin. And so naturally, we find in our initial approach the odd cloud uh, type grains first. So this is now, again, the heliocentric uh, distance and the eccentricity. And you see the, all these detections with the spectrometer subsystem plot at very high eccentricities. And if, and if we take this, these same detections, and plot now the inclination here on the y-axis over the distance to Saturn where they were detected, you see an almost arbitrary distribution in inclination. And this is only to reconcile again with an odd cloud origin or halotype or odd cloud type comets, which only, only they're the only known bodies which can introduce these uh, wide um, variety of inclinations. So, what about the composition of these grains? So the entire exogenous dust data set currently amounts to about 1,800 events, mineral dust grains, which we, um, which we uh, distinguish into four different compositional subtypes. And the 70 odd cloud candidates we found um, mostly go to these magnesium, calcium rich silicates. And this is ongoing work and we try to uh, quantitatively constrain the composition of these grains. But the majority of these grains come from a different source. They come from Saturn-bound orbits, retrograde Saturn-bound orbits that enter uh, the inner Saturnian system, the E-ring, from the outside. And there we have much fewer of these magnesium-rich silicates, but we have mostly grains which have a high iron content, iron oxides or metal iron even, or iron sulfates, uh, sulfides. And indeed, uh, modeling done by Jürgen Schmidt's group in Oulu, Finland, showed that um, grains in a certain size range can move inward from the retrograde moons of Saturn, and if they are about 1.5 to 3 micron in radius, they acquire enough eccentricity by pointing Roberts and Drag to actually pass by Iapetus and Titan, which block the way for the larger grains and enter the E-ring. But the problem, as you might observe, is, well, we see the grains that, we see grains that are smaller than half a micron. And all models agree that such small grains can never uh, migrate into the Saturnian, in the inner Saturnian system. So what we hypothesize is that we actually see collisions of these larger grains that find their way into the E-ring with E-ring grains that are prograde, of course, so we have head-on collisions, and we observe the debris in the smaller grains and get spectra from there. And now, finally, this uh, agrees um, very well with first uh, mo uh, preliminary modeling, which shows that about 10% of these grains can collide with an E-ring grain, and this very well matches also the observations. Now, this is the detections in Saturnian distance, and we exclusively observe these retrograde grains inside the E-ring, although the observation time to the retrograde direction was much more, much, much more uh, intense in the outer E-ring, but we don't see any of these small grains migrating inward, and that's exactly in accordance with the models. They are created only in the E-ring, and this, I think, is a result of these collisions, and we 
will then now in the next year constrain the composition of these retrograde moons by analyzing of these grains. So stay tuned and I have to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. I think we should move on to Bill Kurth. Um, Frank, thank you. If you have questions, you can co contact Frank directly. So the next talk is Bill Kurth, Insights from Radio and Plasma Wave Observations during Cassini's Grand Finale. So I'd like to um, uh, thank the organizers for allowing me to uh, present to you some of the highlights from the radio and plasma wave science investigation at Saturn. Uh, these will um, focus primarily on the grand finale, but a lot of the studies that we've been involved with have actually occurred over the entire mission, and I'll try to highlight some of those. I would like to start with a fairly new result, though, that's actually led by uh, an investigator, Emma Woodfield, who's not even part of our team, um, but she's made, um, uh, I think, a, a great advance in understanding the radiation belt at Saturn. Um, before her work, uh, there was not a good uh, understanding of how the electrons in Saturn's radiation belts were accelerated. A lot of people thought it might be radial diffusion, but that didn't quite work. We looked at coarse emissions. <clears throat> They're typically not strong enough or prevalent enough to, to do the job. And so she's looked at uh, Z-mode emissions uh, that you can see at the uh, lower frequencies here and uh, recognized that these don't propagate uh, very obliquely. They propagate more parallel to the field line. And she's done simulations to show that this can account for a good part of the spectrum of the uh, electrons in Saturn's radiation belt. So I think this is uh, some great work and, and uh, it illustrates the fact that um, um, the study of not only our data set but the entire Cassini data set will continue on and make discoveries like this. Now one of the um, studies that we uh, anticipated uh, all the way back when we wrote our proposal was to understand why this axisymmetric magnetosphere shows rotational modulations. What we didn't realize until we got closer to Saturn was that the period that was detected by the Voyager radio astronomy experiment uh, for Saturn that we thought was telling us the, the, period, the, the length of a day on Saturn actually varied by about a percent. Cassini uh, confirmed this variation and furthermore we found that there are not one but two periods depending upon when you looked one associated with the northern hemisphere, one associated with the southern hemisphere. Uh, uh, there's some sense that uh, these two merged or crossed uh, uh, sometime after the equinox. And I'll have to say that uh, th these periods, show, as you've heard, show up in the magnetic field and the energetic particles as well as the radio waves. And um, I think it, the consensus is that after equinox, it's been relatively difficult to track these periods. Uh, this is some work that uh, has been done um, within our team showing the, the variations of the northern and southern periods of the SKR. Now getting uh, back to uh, the grand finale, uh, I always looked forward to the grand finale orbits because it took the spacecraft across magnetic field lines that connected to the ring system, the icy satellites. It basically took us through that part of the magnetosphere which tied the planet to the rest of its system. And uh, this is indicative of, of some of the types of things we've seen. This is work that uh, Ali uh, Suleiman has been uh, doing. Uh, in fact, he gave a very nice talk yesterday. I'm sorry I can't advertise it for you to go back and listen to it again. Uh, but this is a, a VLF uh, um, plasma wave emission, uh, sometimes called a rural hiss, sometimes called a VLF saucer. Uh, 
We know from the Earth's auroral zone that this type of emission is generated by electron beams. The waves propagate in the same direction as the electron beams. And for this particular event, we were um, down here close to Saturn's ionosphere, just fortunately happened to be on the same magnetic field line that threads through Enceladus. And so this is telling us that there's an electromagnetic interaction between uh, uh, the planet and Enceladus, not dissimilar to one that Don Garnett and uh, Jared Leesner studied earlier in the mission, showed a somewhat simpler uh, feature when we're very close to Enceladus. Uh, it so happens that the magnetometer sees a uh, very well-confined current system associated with the event, this event. So this is one example of the um, connection of Saturn to uh, its system. Uh, in a fairly similar vein, um, and again, Ali Silliman has been studying these events, we see similar funnel-shaped emissions uh, this one is a fairly um, uh, well-filled-in feature. Uh, this is a VLF saucer. It has a much shorter time scale. Um, as depicted by uh, the black dots here, we found evidence for these features uh, throughout the rings, uh, throughout the magnetic fields that intersect uh, at least the, the B and the C rings. And um, Again, we believe these are evidence for electron beams that are flowing along field lines between the planet and the ring system. Uh, you might remember um, Hedman talking about features in the rings that seem to have periods associated with the Saturn kilometric radiation. That kind of implied to us that there ought to be some connection between the rings and the planets, and, and I think this is one evidence of that. I'm not saying that these radio waves have anything to do with the features in the rings, but it does show, again, an electromagnetic interaction between the planet and, um, and the, um, uh, the rings. Now, another uh, thing that we uh, proposed to do was to be able to fly through source regions of the Saturn kilometric radiation it's, it's well believed now that the Saturn kilometric radiation is very similar to the Earth's auroral kilometric radiation, Jupiter's decametric and hectometric radiation, all of which are generated by the cyclotron maser instability. But it wasn't until 2008, uh, relatively early in the Cassini mission, that we had an opportunity to fly through one of these source regions and study it in situ at any location other than at Earth. And so uh, we had two opportunities earlier in the mission to do this, and the ring grazing orbits and the uh, grand finale uh, gave us uh, a number of additional opportunities to do this. This is from a science paper that Laurent Lamy published earlier this year. It shows, and you, you really have to pay attention to this very small feature here, it shows a, a time period where we're detecting radio emissions actually below the local electron cyclotron frequency. And that's actually a, a characteristic um, observation that we use to determine that we're in a source region. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the CAPS data uh, at this time to analyze the source of the uh, free energy for this emission. But uh, Laurent found that if he looks at the time period when the radio emission was at lower frequencies than the cyclotron frequency, the electron density as um, given by uh, the Langmuir probe, uh, there's a proxy data set, it uses the, 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 the potential to tell us what the density is doing. Uh, even though we were crossing um, a fairly wide range of, of uh, upward current systems, uh, downward precipitation, uh, where you might expect a source region over this entire green area. Uh, the electron density appeared to jump up at this point in time, actually quenching the radio emission. And this is uh, due to a uh, criteria that uh, the theoreticians that have developed the cyclotron maser instability uh, uh, wrote down a long time ago that the, the plasma frequency has to, very, has to be a very small fraction of the cyclotron frequency for this mechanism to work, and so we're seeing that in action here. 
Now you've heard uh, a number of discussions about the interaction of the rings with the, the ionosphere and references to the RPWS electron density measurements. Um, our instrument uh, consists not only of a wave instrument that detects electric and magnetic waves over a broad frequency range, but also a Langmuir probe that studies the thermal properties of electrons and even ions. Uh, that was actually added to study Titan, but it's been very useful to study uh, Saturn's ionosphere as well. Um, and Pursun has used the upper frequency cutoff of auroral Hiss emissions, uh, VLF Hiss emissions in the ionosphere to uh, determine the plasma density. Uh, these uh, Whistler mode emissions have an upper frequency cutoff of the lower of the cyclotron frequency or the plasma frequency. And in this case, the cyclotron frequency was generally quite a bit higher than the plasma frequency. So she's done um, very detailed density profiles and matched those to the electron densities coming from the Langmuir probe, and they agree very well. So we're, we're gratified by the fact that we have two totally independent measurements of the density, and even down to the fine structure, uh, we see um, uh, coincidence. Now the Langmuir probe also can measure currents due to ions, and uh, they found that there's a mismatch between the electron density and the positive ion density, which has led them to uh, postulate that there are uh, a class of very tiny grains, possibly similar to those that you've heard of um, detected by Mimi and, and CDA. Uh, but it's another piece of the puzzle as to what's going on uh, in the ionosphere. Some of the other plots here you'll see, uh, we discovered that there's a very large variation in the density. Even though we think we have very good measurements of the, the ionospheric density, each ionospheric profile is quite a bit different than the other. Uh, you can get uh, different uh, scale heights by um, uh, fitting um, uh, simple functions to these. This is some work that Ann Pursun has done and uh, Lena Hadid and, and uh, Michiko Maruka have done similar things. And um, so there's just quite a bit of work uh, that's been done on this and continuing to be done. I wanted to mention that even though the RPWS is not a dust instrument, we're not calibrated to do dust measurements, we can de detect dust in basically any orientation, which means that when CDA doesn't happen to be pointing in the right direction, we can still get information on the dust flux. And I'd have to point out that uh, Xing Yi here, I think he's probably in the audience, has done the majority of the work on looking at the dust impacts observed by RPWS. And we've studied the E-ring. Um, uh, we've done uh, quite a bit of work. Uh, Xing Yi has published a paper in GRL recently on the ring uh, near the uh, uh, orbits of Janus and Epimetheus. Um, he's got a profile here of the D-ring dust. I should say that when we got inside of the D-ring on that first grand finale orbit, uh, we looked for micron-sized particles. The RPWS is not really sensitive to uh, at, at the ten, tens of kilometers per second velocity range, uh, particles much below about a tenth of a micron. Uh, I think the project was happy that we didn't find a large flux of those larger particles uh, in those orbits. Uh, I, I don't want to leave out Titan. Uh, there's been an, uh, an enormous amount of work done on the electron density and Titan's ionosphere, uh, evidence for uh, the ion density and negative ions. Uh, we even participated, well, uh, We've seen a, a solar cycle variation in the ion density as a function of the, basically, the EUV flux uh, from the sun. And when Titan happened to be out in the solar wind ahead of the bow shock, uh, this uh, simulation by Nicomedi shows that the bow shock was actually deformed, uh, encompassing both the planet and, um, and Titan. And just one last piece I, I'd like to mention, Ann Pursun has been looking at the upper hybrid resonance frequency for the entire mission. Uh, she and Don Garnett published a paper back in 2009, which uh, went into about the orbit, a little bit closer than the orbit of Enceladus, uh, 
provided uh, a very good plasma density model for the inner magnetosphere. She's now continuing that work inward to uh, just beyond the outer, the, the ring system, and that work is, is underway and should be published shortly, I think. So I'm going to stop here, and uh, thank you very much. Is there a quick question for Bill? If not, we should probably move along. Um, our final speaker of the morning session is Jeff Kessey. Saturn's Rings, Post Cassini Highlights and Overview. Okay, morning everybody. I'm going to try to weave together uh, a summary uh, of what all this wonderful stuff means for the rings uh, based on observations and analysis done by dozens of ring scientists, certainly not only myself, including, and my, including my co-author Matt uh, Tiscarino. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about the context. Many of you don't work with rings every day, don't maybe know this, talk about the fluid nature of the rings, talk about how moonlets influence ring structure, uh, talk about particle size and the composition of the ring material, and try to uh, put together what we've learned in the story of the big picture, age and origin of the rings, which is maybe best constrained by uh, this pollution by external uh, meteorites, or meteoroids. So here they are, the beautiful rings off the outermost uh, or A ring, the middle or B ring, the most massive ring, and the innermost C ring. The inner part of the, the outer part of the C ring has some structures we call plateaus, which I'll talk about later. I'm going to talk more about these gaps in the A ring and some other features later. I'll talk a little bit about the stranded F ring later. I'm not going to say much about the B ring, partly, mostly, because we really don't understand uh, any of that structure in particular. Uh, you m may be able to detect some very faint color, maybe compositional variations in there. They're very interesting. We're just starting to get started on that. But the thing that's really most important to keep uh, in mind about the B-ring is this is where all the mass is. Now, this is a picture uh, taken when the sun was illuminating the other face of the ring. So you can obviously see here the B-ring is blocking almost all the light, and in particular, the central part of the B-ring is almost entirely opaque. So this is uh, the part that we are the most concerned about in terms of the mass of the rings, but we don't know much about the structure. So most of what I'm going to talk about is the structure. How do we get all this beautiful structure uh, in, in the rings? Well, this illustrates uh, some of this uh, here. Uh, on the left panel, we have um, uh, uh, sort of a vertical cross section, the ring seen edge on. The ring particles are mostly centimeters to meters in size. And uh, their constant gentle collisions tend to damp their velocities down, so they lay in a very dense layer near the uh, equatorial plane. But all these many, many collisions actually give the rings a pressure and a viscosity, just like the molecules in, in, the, in the atmosphere colliding with each other give uh, air a pressure and viscosity. And we describe ring physics mostly using the equations of fluid dynamics as influenced by the very small uh, gravity that's local, as you can see here, and the uh, tidal shear. So this uh, movie illustrates tidal shear this is a movie moving along with the ring material at this central point. Closer to Saturn's stuff moves faster. Further from Saturn, stuff falls behind. The very faint self-gravity tends to make the stuff want to clump. And the tidal shear constantly is stretching and tearing these things apart. It makes our analysis a little bit more, more complicated because the ring material is very uh, heterogeneous. But that's what we have to do with. So when we uh, apply uh, the, uh, these perturbers to this fluid dynamics here, we uh, 
for instance, perturbers such as moons. Linda talked about these. The moon Pan is actually the moon in this gap here in uh, the A ring. There's another little tiny gap here, the Keeler gap. Uh, also, we see uh, in the A ring variety of features, spiral waves I'll talk about in the next slide, caused mostly by external moons such as Prometheus here, which is much bigger, mostly influences the F ring on the side here. You can also see in this uh, Anki gap here some uh, little residual material that might be piling up around the equator of these moons, as, as Linda mentioned. Okay, so this uh, is a close-up of the Yankee Gap here on the left and the Keeler Gap uh, to scale. And uh, what we see here is uh, a moonlet in the Keeler Gap, Daphnis. And you can see uh, little waves on the edge of the gap, both in the Yankee Gap here and in the Keeler Gap. You notice here in the, in the uh, Keeler Gap, the waves are only downstream in the sense of the fluid motion because, again, by tidal shear, this material is moving up, this material is moving down. So basically the material moves past the moon, gets a little bit of a kick, and starts to oscillate. As illustrated in this uh, computer graphic down here, uh, where you see ring material coming from the left to the right, getting a, a kick from the moon, undergoing this oscillation. Beautiful pattern, very much like we, what we see. The way to envision this is as if you had a rock embedded in a stream, where the moonlet is the rock, the stream flows past, you get a ripple, the ripple is more or less tied to the rock, the fluid flows on by. And when the moon interacts gravitationally with these perturbations, it can actually force the material away, clearing a gap. Actually, this is how we understand a lot of what we like to think are planets in protoplanetary disks, clearing gaps, this is our best example. A current puzzle, though, is we have several gaps in the rings where the uh, where we have not been able to find any moonlets. So that's sort of a big problem here. I'm going to go on to um, this, uh, Scott, uh, this, uh, what is this? Minutes left to, yeah, left. to, to 10, in my 10. 13. Oh, 13, okay, good. You get six minutes and 45 seconds. Okay, okay, that's about right. Okay, so we have here these beautiful spiral patterns mm -hmm. here. These are caused by um, perturbations at very specific radii, they're called resonances, where the ring period is a simple fraction of the moon period with some exterior moon, and because of the ring's gravity, they propagate in this beautiful way. The physics is just like the arms of spiral galaxies, but they're much more tightly wrapped here. One of the nice uh, features of these waves is that we can measure the mass density of the rings locally and the mass of the moons, which is why we know that the moons are these under-dense rubble piles that Linda mentioned. In addition, Saturn can uh, play this game too because Saturn, big blob of gas, it's got modes flopping around inside and they get carried around by the rotation of the planet. So the interior rotation of Saturn can actually drive waves in the rings as well. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as time goes on. Okay, so now moving out just outside the rings, here's an example of some of these moons that are outside the rings. There's the red dots kind of show as a function of radius from the rings, the mass where these little moonlets are. Uh, these moons, because of their spiral density waves, are actually caused to drift away from the rings. It's like a tidal effect. And models have indicated these white dots are little moonlets being formed at the very outer edge of the ring and they move out at the rate uh, determined by these spiral density waves. And it's very hard to actually keep the moonlets close to the rings for the age of the solar system. This is 50 million years. This is like a couple hundred million years. You can see already the moons are too far away. So this actually became one of the first arguments in favor of a very uh, young ring system. We actually thought we were seeing one of these guys form at the edge of the ring and start to move away. Uh, uh, very, uh, around 2014, but this thing actually broke up and never really escaped. So I'll talk about the second argument later. Uh, the, the F ring is a dynamically chaotic place, but I think I'll save that for backup if anybody wants to ask me. This is one of our very highest resolution slides uh, taken in the uh, grand finale orbits, showing in the A ring, here's one of these waves, all these little flecks 
are flocks of millions of small embedded moonlets, maybe only 100 meters in size, and what you're seeing is them disturbing the surrounding ring material, millions of them. You're not seeing the, the moonlet itself. And we don't really know if these are actually uh, shards of the ring parent or something that's locally created. This is a model, they did a close up of what you might see. Here's the little object, here's the ring material flowing by, these two disturbed regions. Looks a little bit like a propeller in an old fashioned airplane, that's why we call these things propeller objects. The bigger ones we can actually track and we see they actually move somewhat randomly around the rings by several kilometers over the uh, duration of the mission. Now these are the sea ring plateaus that, we, uh, that I pointed out in the outer part of the sea ring, very beautiful regular structures, a um, uh, couple hundred kilometers wide where there's more material. The thing is they don't have any more mass in the surroundings, so it's a little bit of a puzzle how such interesting, narrow, well-defined features can be due just to a different particle size. More, more smaller particles creates these things. Here is a gap that's caused, we now know, by a Saturn interior mode two to one resonance, and there's a ringlet there. Well, we can learn a couple of really interesting things about what's now called the field of chrono seismology. We can learn something about the deep interior structure of Saturn, its deep core has a diffuse outer boundary, maybe due to diffusion. And now, finally, we have a way of getting at the deep rotation period of Saturn, which, as Michelle told you, it's almost impossible to get from the magnetic field. As a talk by Chris Mankiewicz uh, later today, very, very interesting result. So these uh, waves from Saturn are, are of great interest. Here's this uh, high, um, high, uh, resolution slide, I think Linda talked about this, uh, these streaks might be due to small objects in this plateau. Uh, I don't think I'm gonna say much more about this uh, with time uh, on my mind here. Okay, so here's a, a spectrum of the ring brightness all the way from infrared to microwave. And this has been known for decades since the 70s that the emission from the rings is at the physical temperature in the infrared but at much lower temperatures in the microwave. Sears has measured this uh, deflection. It was, it was known very early that this could be explained if you had a combination of sort of wavelength sized particles, mostly water ice. But with Cassini now, Dick French talked about the enormous amount of new information we have on particle sizes from radio science occultations. And also we have from Cassini much better radio maps of the brightness of the rings. Putting these things together, we can really nail the non-icy material fraction in the rings at less than 1%. So this is the first key about getting the age of the rings, very low non-icy fraction. But they're not all water ice. You can tell from this color enhanced version, they're quite reddish. There's been a debate going on as to whether or not this was organic material like in carrots and uh, tomatoes and paws, and carbon rings or good old fashioned rust like on Mars. Well, you've heard all about this from others, so I'm not gonna say much about it. The main bottom line here is, first of all, in these last orbits, as Dick mentioned, we have measured the ring mass now. It's not very large. This is the second major clue to the age of the rings. But I think, to me, the main take home from all this combination of the INMS and the uh, Mimi is all this organic material. To me, this answers the question, the rings are red because of organics. This D-ring here, uh, most of this material, as uh, Hunter mentioned, is, and uh, Don mentioned, is coming from, here's the D-ring right here. And you can see it's a very low optical depth, very, it's a tiny little part of the ring. Michelle's magnetic field boundary is right about there. Okay, so there's not much stuff there. It varies with time between Voyager and Cassini, and it's losing mass, if Hunter is right, at a prodigious rate, such that we have to transfer a lot of mass from the main rings inward as time goes on. Now, how do you do this? This, this gets us a little bit to the third leg of the young ring story, which has to do with something Frank touched on, which is the meteorite mass that is entering the rings today measured by the CDA at various parts along its orbit. 
Uh, as this stuff falls in, now this is primitive material, 30% rock, 30% carbon, you know, it's not water ice and it pollutes the pure water ice at a rate that depends on its flux and the mass of the ring. So one of the very important two things they found, one is the total mass and the second is the orbital distribution. Now Frank said something that disagrees a little bit with this plot. Most of these measurements that contribute to the most of the mass coming into the ring are fairly low inclination and they're prograde. In these, as I understand it, they look like these Kuiper belt objects. Primarily the Oort cloud material that Frank mentioned, I think he told me is a very small part of the mass. So now that we have the mass coming in, the mass of the rings and the pollution of the rings, we can actually estimate the age of the rings and we're coming up with a number that's something like a few hundred million years. Something like born with the dinosaurs. <laughs> so this is a little bit hard to uh, accept in some ways. A system as massive as Saturn's rings can be young. But actually it's a little bit unusual. All the giant planets have rings, but Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune, the rings are very wimpy and they're made of primarily dark stuff. Saturn's rings are totally unique in their massive icy property and also now we believe they're young. So how do you understand this? Very quickly, this is sort of my last slide. Uh, uh, if the rings were old, you could, you could explain them either by an impact because uh, impactors were pretty common in the old days, but they would get polluted. Maybe you could try to solve this by breaking up a ginormous object like Titan and have a very massive early ring, but these massive early rings evolve very quickly down to the current mass of the ring and they would also get polluted. A very recent scenario that's just come out in the last couple of years is that the moon system of Saturn can actually be very slowly expanding until just one or 200 million years ago and hit a resonance that destabilizes it, leading to collisions that actually create a whole bunch of rubble and maybe form the rings and the moons just a couple hundred million years ago. Well, there are a bunch of loose ends still left to be dealt with here, including maybe counting craters on the satellites, something I have a backup slide on if anybody wants to ask me about the core of the parent body may still be in the rings. Okay, anyway. That is my talk, and uh, I just want to close with the fact that even though Cassini's uh, observational phase is over, the fun is not over. We've got lots of work to do and lots of problems to solve. Thank you, Jeff. I think we're well over our allotted time, so I'm going to call an end to the session. That concludes the morning session, and thank you to all our speakers.